It is so great to have you, Helen, in Chicago. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's, um, it's pretty scary. I turned up yesterday, and within about five minutes, I'm like, oh, yeah, Chicago. Yeah, I like you got this us. place. I'll have to come back here. Yeah, you feel good? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very nice to hear. Yeah. Because you've been traveling a lot with this book, right? It's, it's, been, it's been like a rock and roll tour, but without, <laughs> without the sex and drugs, just with books. Right. Know, it's, been, it's been lovely. I've had a great time. Sex and drugs. No hawks. No hawks. No, 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 no. no. I mean, it is the thing that struck me about this book that there's many ways to connect to it, right? That, you know, many of us have lost someone that we love deeply and have experienced grief. Many of us have a deep relationship to history or, or, or to nature in particular. Um, and even some of us, including Carla, have experience with actual hawks. But it's still, I mean, I, I was sitting here reading this thinking, you know, you, you brought this wild, murderous creature into your like spare bedroom and your living room and we're hanging out watching TV with yeah. it. You know, there's just something that is completely unusual. Not for you, because you have a long history. Yeah, a long and eccentric history of yeah. having books in the house. Yeah. But you know, I think that's a really interesting observation because lots of nature writing books, you know, over the centuries, they've all been the same kind of journey. They tend to be, you know, guys putting the rucksack on and going off into the wild. And I love those books, you know. But I brought the wild inside my right. house and inside me. And that was a very different kind of experience. Yeah. Um, I just want to say I had this amazing, um, that sense of when you write a book, you can't control the meanings that people give to it. I was yeah. in Washington, D.C. the other week, and this guy came up to me at the, uh, the line, signing line. And he said, he was, like a, he was very young and he was wearing a very nice suit, you know. And he said, I know what your book's really about. And I said, what? And he said, international diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, do you work in international? Said, yeah. So wow. it's, it's an amazing how you, people can take different things. Right, it, right. Amazing. Yeah. Well, right. And you talk, I mean, so much of what this book is about is the things that we project on right. to nature. Yeah. And that the wild can be human work in, in right. very wonderful ways and very disturbing ways <laughs> or strange. But what, I mean, what was the thing for you that made you fall for hawks in particular and the gauze hawk? Oh, Lord. Well, uh, I was so young that I, I, you know, when I was really tiny, you know, this is a really emotionally open book. Anyone that's read it yeah. knows that I, I you know, I'm, I'm very Californian in this book. I just put it all on the table, right? <laughs> um, that sounds like I'm being evil to Californians. I don't mean that. Um, <laughs> but there's, you know, I, there's only one thing in the book that I'm a bit embarrassed about that still makes me cringe, and it's the bit where I confess that when I was very small, I tried to sleep with my arms behind my back like <laughs> wings. Um, you were you not know. an early yoga practitioner. Right, I wanted to be a hawk, you know, yeah. and it was just, I was tiny when I got obsessed with them. All my friends had pictures of pop stars on their bedroom walls, and I had pictures of kestrels. And, uh, and when I discovered there was a thing called falconry, I just thought, that's it, I'm going to be a falconer when I grow up. And I think my mother about twice said to me quietly, are you sure you wouldn't rather be a lawyer? But only <laughs> twice. And I became a falconer, but I never wanted to train goshawks. They had this reputation as being... Um, well, they're kind of the Christopher Walkens of the, of the bird world. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do this. I, I, this tour has been so fun. I was in Westport in Connecticut a while ago, and I, I, I explained that they were the Christopher Walkens of the bird world, and everyone went very quiet. And then later, they all came up to me and said, you know he lives here. Oh. <laughs> He's a very nice man. He's not a psychopath. And I'm like, no, no, I know, I know. Um, I meant his roles. But yeah, they were these, 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 they were these very macho birds that were considered to right. be like feathered shotguns, and I didn't really want to know. But then my father died, and all I could think about was goshawks, and I dreamt about them every night. And I think after a big loss, quite often, you're compelled or you're driven towards things, or you make decisions that are not conscious or logical. They're driven by very deep things within you. Mm -hmm. And somehow I just knew that what I needed was a goshawk. Right. I don't recommend that generally as a way of dealing with grief. <laughs> right. but yeah. Maybe we'll talk more about your advice around grieving later. <laughs> um, let's, uh, if you would, would you start and read? Because I mean, okay, so you, you never wanted to train a goshawk, but you went and got one and did this and brought her into her, your home. Yeah. Mabel, Mabel. Um, and who's, you know, a really an incredible, you know, you've, you've added to the history of animals in literature, you know, no one will yeah. forget Mabel, um, who's read this book. But so could you read, this yeah. is the beginning of the rite of passage where you, you know, you go into your full length sure. description of her. Um, and at this point, she's kind of 
getting acclimated to your house. Yeah, she's still a baby. She still has blue eyes. Goshawk's eyes are amazing. When they're very young, they're sort of blue, and they turn gray, and then white, and then yellow. And finally, when they grow up, they're these burning sort of orange coal colors. But this is her when she's still very young. So this is me describing my hawk. The feathers down her front are the color of sunned newsprint of tea-stained paper, and each is marked darkly towards its tip with a leaf-bladed spearhead. So from her throat to her feet, she is patterned with a shower of falling raindrops. Her wings are the color of stained oak, their covert feathers edged in palest teak, barred feathers folded quietly beneath. And there's a strange gray tint, tint to her that is felt rather than seen, a kind of silvery light like a rainy sky reflected from the surface of a river. She looks new, looks as if the world cannot touch her, as if everything that exists and is observed rolls off like drops of water from her oiled and close-packed feathers. And the more I sit with her, the more I marvel at how reptilian she is, the lucency of her pale round eyes, the waxy yellow skin about her bakelite black beak, the way she snakes her head from side to side to focus on distant objects. <laughs> Half the time she seems as alien as, as a snake, a thing hammered of metal and scales and glass, but then I see ineffably bird-like things about her, familiar qualities that turn her into something lovable and close. She scratches her fluffy chin with one awkward taloned foot, sneezes when bits of errant down get up her nose, and when I, look, when I look again, she seems neither bird nor reptile, but a creature shaped by a million years of evolution for a life she's not yet lived. Those long barred tail feathers and short broad wings are perfectly shaped for sharp turns and brutal acceleration through a world of woodland obstacles. The patterns on her plumage will hide her in perfect camouflaging drifts of light and shade. The tiny, the tiny hair-like feathers between her beak and eye, crines, are for catching blood so that it will dry and flake and fall away. And the frowning eyebrows that lend her face its hollow, rapacious intensity are bony projections to protect her eyes when crashing into undergrowth after prey. Everything about this hawk is tuned and turned to hunt and kill. Yesterday I discovered that when I suck air through my teeth and make a squeaking noise like an injured rabbit, <laughs> all the tendons in her toes instantaneously contract, driving her talons into the glove with terrible crushing force. This killing grip is an old, deep pattern in her brain, an innate response that hasn't yet found the stimulus meant to provoke it, because other sounds make it happen, door hinges, squealing brakes, bicycles with unoiled wheels, and on the second afternoon, Joan Sutherland singing an aria on the radio. <laughs> Ow, I laughed out loud at that. Stimulus, opera. Response, kill. <laughs> but later, these misapplied instincts stop being funny. At just past six o'clock, a small, unhappy wail came from a pram outside the window, and straight away the hawk drove her talons into my glove, ratcheting up the pressure in savage, stabbing spasms. Kill. The baby cries. Kill, kill, kill. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> it's quite dark, isn't it, that one? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about my microphone hopelessness. I apologize for that. So the, the interesting thing is that, um, so clearly Mabel is, as goshawks are described, she has that instinct yeah. to kill. She's this powerful, incredibly, and otherly, otherworldly figure. But you discover a lot of things about her that kind of fly in the face of conventional wisdom about goshawks that, yeah. that she plays. Yeah, people, people sort of think of them as feathered shotguns, these efficient, merciless you know, remorseless killers. And mm -hmm. pretty soon I discovered that there are a lot more than that. And I think that happens with all animals. You know, once you live with them, you realize that they're never quite, they're always more than you think. So pretty soon I discovered that she was very, very playful. And it ended up with me being able to scrunch up paper balls, throw them to her, and she'd catch them in her beak and then throw them back to me with her eyes half closed in kind of goshawk laughter. And we used to play for ages like this. Uh, we used to watch television, and my goshawks <laughs> watch more antiques programs and moving house programs than any <laughs> goshawk in the history of the world. But the funny thing is, in the book, I talk about how sad I am because a couple of my goshawk are friends. It's, it's quite a masculine bird to have. They're, they all tend to be boys. They said, you don't play with goshawks. You don't. You hunt with them. You kill things with them. 
And later I discovered that they all play with their goss hooks. They just don't like to talk about it, right? Which tells us more about the culture of masculinity yeah, in folk Why is that, than ever, right? right? I mean, you know, it's right. being soft. It's being soft. You're it's not being supposed soft. to be soft, yeah. yeah. But they're very playful and enormous fun. I mean, you know, and when she used to eat, she'd sort of squeak through her nose like a kind of teddy bear. I mean, she was a massive, wonderful contradictions. So that a little bit of that is about who you are as well, right? Yeah. Because, um, I mean, and I don't mean this in a sensualist way, but you're a woman. So you're not sort of steeped in that culture necessarily, but you're also not part of the, you're not aristocracy, right? You're not someone coming along. It's and true. <laughs> Working class family, Irish family, and a woman. You know, I'm not, I'm not the typical falconer, really. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. a bit at the beginning of the book where I talk about how when I was 12, I went out with these, these guys with goshawks for the first time, and you know, I thought I was one of them. <laughs> 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 I know, they offered me snuff. I, I was like, I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> I really thought, and I think that's, that's the weird thing about being small is quite often you, well, I think everyone does, you begin to really believe that everyone initially is, is like you, and then suddenly you realize that they're not. And uh, I was a definite eccentric, strange child. I mean, falconry was, you know, there were hardly any women practicing it at the time. Um, but if you go back to the 11th and 12th century, falconry was a very, a lot of women f flew hawks. Um, and they didn't just fly little hawks, they flew goshawks and jerf falcons. I mean, it was, there's a wonderful quote from the writer John of Salisbury back then, which said, that, you know, the fairer sex excel at the hunting of birds. Hmm. Something happened, and it was to do with that weird way that space became gendered, I guess, that outside spaces like the hunting field and, you know, the fields became male spaces and interior spaces became women's spaces. And when that happened, falconry kind of dropped off female... Um, kind of activities, really. But we, we're coming back now. Trust me, there's a lot more women falconers. Right, and that's something that you then upended as well by bringing that hawk into the domestic space. Right, right, bringing it, yeah. into, bringing it inside, yeah. 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 So um, it's fascinating because the book is, as much as it's about you and this story of raising and training a hawk, a gauze hawk, mm. it's also a story, there's a parallel story running along of... T. H. White, Tim White, right, yeah. right, who um, was one of the figures from your childhood, who wrote a book about raising a goshawk that, that you, I hated. You hated, yeah. You kind of have a love-hate relationship with him. I still do, really. Yeah. yeah. What ways do you identify with him? Well, um, I mean, I'm sure many of you have read *The Sword in the Stone* and *The Once and Future King*. These extraordinary retellings of the Arthurian legend for the 20th century, really born out of the Second World War and, and the, the question of power and the way that power is used and abused. Mm -hmm. um, I guess initially, um, when I read that book when I was eight, I hated it because, as I say in the book, he didn't know what he was doing and he was very in unintentionally very cruel to this goshawk he was trying to train. But I knew also that it was somehow he was running away from something to train this hawk. He was running away from something as hard as he could, and the hawk was some kind of escape. I didn't know then what he was running from, and much later I worked out that he was gay, which was not a brilliant thing to be if you were born in 1906. I mean, not a brilliant thing today if you are born in all sorts of different places. Yeah. Um, and he was struggling to maintain this fiction that he was a normal, a normal person. That was what he wanted to try and be. It's very poignant, and the hawk was an escape from that, from that sense of needing to f conform. And I guess when I, the big parallels of that, the parallel is that I was also running away from grief, my father's death to train a hawk. And I think maybe my early reading of his book was kind of where I got that idea from. You know, I'm broken. What do I do? I know I'll get a goshawk. <laughs> Didn't really work for him, but there you go. Uh, but the other thing is that both he and I made the same mistake, and that's, I think, one of the deepest themes, I hope, of the book, is how both of us, in our different ways, saw the hawks as mirrors of ourselves. I saw Mabel as, a, as my grief. I want, you know, she was this escape from it. She was this sort of thing that was wild and, and didn't have to experience human emotion. It was all, she was all the things I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And for White, you know, his hawk was... Um, slightly sadistic, you know, he had kind of sadistic impulses he never acted on. Um, it was, um, you know, wild and uncivilized and it didn't have to conform. Um, he also talked about it being slightly kind of gay, which is really, I don't quite know how he managed to make that leap, but, you know, <laughs> um, it was everything he wanted to be and yet he was trying to civilize it when he was training it. I mean, it was, when you read that book, it's so poignant, this book called The Goshawk that he, 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 he used as a Sort of relate, to relate this, this, this thing he tried to do, because quite often you start to feel there's no hawk in it at all. It's just him kind of punching himself in a mirror. So I guess I wanted to kind of 
talk about his book, but it wasn't until I, I went through his unpublished papers and archives at the University of Texas that I began to realize that I wanted him to have more space in the book. His story is so instructive. It's a story about how, where evil comes from, I guess. It's, it's not from people being evil normally, it's from people who have never been given the tools to care or love things, including themselves, and mm -hmm. they create terrible you know, miseries yeah. quite without no understanding why they're doing it, so yeah. Yeah, yeah he's a very tragic figure mm. in the book. Um, and he, like you said, he wants to, he views that feral state, wi the wildness as being a form of freedom, which yeah. I think you initially think is, is something possible as well, right? There's that, it enables everything you, don't, you want it to be. Um, so you go hawk in the book. I do. So what's that like? What's it like to inhabit uh, an, a being like Mabel, who's not a human being? Yeah. Well, yeah, it was, this, it was, you know, remorselessly fierce identification. I didn't want to be me anymore, didn't want to be human, didn't want to feel all my grief, so I just wanted to be this bird. And I did it, I did pretty well with that identification. I mean, I'm basically, without pulling my punches, I went pretty nuts. Um, you know, and I was out for, as you say, for hours every day with this bird, watching her fly across frosty English hillsides, you know, winking in the sun, flashing across these things. It completely changed the way I saw the countryside. And I mean, I can go into sort of detail about how, yeah, how that yeah. was. So normally when I go out into the countryside, I've kind of, some part of me is still that kind of naturalist kind of, you know, I'll look at a landscape and I'll see all the things in it. I'll see a sort of horse and a house and some plants and some trees and everything has names. I know what they all call, most of the things are called. And I unconsciously rank everything in order of importance. So generally the house and the tree is more important than the ant. You know, it's kind of how, how I kind of work, how we all work. When I was out with the hawk, everything lost names. It was so weird. Mm -hmm. I didn't really think about what anything was. I didn't, everything was just as important as everything else, so the ant was as important as the house, right? And um, even more so, everything became very complicated. So when I looked at a tree, I didn't say that's an oak tree. I just saw the leaves and the branches and the shadows in it. So in my, it, it w again, it was an imaginative act to do with being with this hawk, but it really was deeply, deeply strange and I guess it was like taking a lot of drugs, right? But with a, with a hawk rather than actually doing it. And I, I got l you could get, I could get lost in that landscape. I could forget everything. Um, it was a really addictive experience. Mm -hmm. Every day, I just got lost in this, in this scape of of complicated things. It was amazing. It was amazing, mm. but then it was also pretty dark. When did it stop being amazing, or why did it <laughs> stop being amazing? Well, I guess, um, I mean, it was dark because the hawk was hunting, right? So, you know, um, and when goshawks hunt, they just start eating what they've caught instantly. So I had to go in there and put these poor rabbits and pheasants out of their misery, which was a very, very uh, serious thing to do for me. I mean, it was hard. Um, so that was happening, which brought me up and close and personal to death on a kind of daily basis. Um, I used to eat, you know, Mabel and I shared what she caught. It wasn't wasted. I'm obviously, I cooked my, my bit. A lot of very bad meals <laughs> that year, because I had no money, so I used to haunt around the reduced section of the supermarket. So I remember yeah. one day having stewed rabbit and stale English crumpets for dinner. Not, <laughs> not a good one, guys, don't, don't do that. Did you ever eat anything that Mabel caught? Always, yeah, yeah everything, yeah, I ate, I ate everything. I mean, she caught a frog once, I didn't eat that. <laughs> she caught a frog? Yeah, she caught a frog. I was like, Mabel. Um, <laughs> But there was also a lot of poaching that year. I mean, one of the great things about being in Chicago is that it's very unlikely there are any local landowners from Cambridgeshire in the audience who want to have a word with me about all those pheasants that my hawk caught that they sh she shouldn't have done. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, when I was out in the field with her, it was wonderful. When I came back home, things started to go very wrong. Um, I remember waking up in the morning and my pillow would be soaking wet and I had no idea why. I used to think I had an eye allergy or maybe the roof was leaking. <laughs> ridiculous. I'd been crying all night, yeah. you know, from missing my dad, and I didn't really know. I wasn't feeling it, because I wasn't letting myself feel it. And I went really quite bonkers. I remember one point there was a knock on the door, and it was the mailman, and I, was, I ended up hiding behind the sofa. And I, even then I thought, this is not normal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was basically in a state of pretty serious depression, but it was an unusual depression because it was very beautiful but I was completely lost. Yeah. I really got lost in that, in that world. You know, the, the power of this book, I mean, there's so many levels, right, to it, um, which is part of what makes it powerful, but your relationship with your father, I mean, I can understand getting lost, because he was, you guys were 
not just father and daughter, you were friends. We were buddies, we were proper buddies, yeah. Yeah. So what influence did he have on you? I mean, I, you have this scene in the book, so that, that getting lost out in the wild and looking up in, for hours or watching Mabel fly, you know, there's this kind of precedent for it in your child, but also in your father, who was a, I don't know if it's the proper term, a plane spotter. He was a plane spotter. Oh, right. <laughs> this, is, this always seems to me quite an English disease, plane spotting. Um, there are wonderful stories of, well, sad stories quite, re you know, a few years ago of sort of, you know, a whole bunch of English plane spotters being arrested in some country somewhere because they've been watching planes at a, an airport and got arrested because no one, I think it was in Greece, no one in the Greek authorities would understand why anyone would stand and watch planes all day. Like, why would you do that? But yeah, he was, he was a watcher. Um, he was a press photographer, a very good one. And um, yeah, we should say... Alistair MacDonald, he worked for the Daily Mirror. Yeah, he worked Mirror. for the Daily Mirror. Yeah, I don't know if any of you have seen that photograph of Charles and Diana kissing on the balcony after they were married. That was one of his. And in Her fact, dad. it was an amazing story that he, he stood in the same place for 12 hours to get that picture without eating or drinking or, or going to the loo. And, and um, he got the picture, right? And he came back and he was really, really rough. He was really unwell and dehydrated. And my mom was really angry with him. Like, you know, and he said, I've got the picture. That's my dad, right? Yeah. And then they printed it with the wrong caption oh so he was not happy about that but he was a very good photographer but yeah he loved to watch planes when he was small and I talk in the book about how I realized slowly that that was a kind of way of him dealing with the circumstances of his own life when he was young because he grew up during the war and in London during the war you know those things were coming overhead and it was very important that you knew whether they were ones that were going to drop bombs on you or save you and he used to stand in, uh, when he was very small, he'd cycle on his bicycle to local aerodromes, as they were called then, with a sort of fizzy soda and an egg sandwich. Mm -hmm. And he'd stand there for 12 hours watching planes. And it, I just, you know, there's part of him in me, that bird part is definitely from my dad. Um, and yeah, and I think also he taught me to love to love the differences in the world. Mm -hmm. He once, I'm sorry, I'm going on. Do stop, I've had a lot of coffee this morning. If I, if you do stop no, me. No, no. He once brought home a field guide. We loved field guides. He loved to go out with me. We used to go out and identify mushrooms and plants and things. He taught me to be a naturalist. And this um, oh. field guide was a, a, it was a guide to the nymphal stages of Saharan African grasshoppers. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm like, come on, Dad. Like, seriously. <laughs> like, you're never going to see an adult stage of a Saharan grasshopper, let alone a nymphal stage. And I laughed at him. I was about 19. And he looked a little bit hurt, and he said, open it. And I was so ashamed. I opened this book, and it was full of pages and pages of the most exquisite watercolors of these creatures I didn't know existed. And I was like, yeah, all right, okay. That was my dad. He could just t take joy in all the moving, different, beautiful parts of the world. How did he talk about um, nature with you, I mean, what did what did he see in it? What is it? I mean, this guy idea of being a watcher. What? what yeah. What did you? Well, he was quite a private man, and he wasn't a very talkative man. But he mm -hmm. would he would point things out, and that's kind of how it worked. I think we'd go out, and you know, he'd sort of say, you know, what do you think that is? And I'd be like, oh, I think that's a so and so. And we'd kind of piece together identifications from the books, and it was that kind of almost wordless working out of what things are and where and their place in the world that I. I really treasure. I mean, we had a few. We had a few scrapes. I remember once we went to a uh, a place on the Kennington Avon Canal to listen to nightingales, which were amazing. I mean, you, you know, they really are incredible sound. And I fell into a um, a mud pit when he was around the corner. I had to haul myself out with basically the equivalent of poison ivy. And I was covered in mud oh. and sort of dung. I think it was a farmer's slurry pit. And I had to sit in the car all the way home. And he said, "We're never going to get away with this." Your mother's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> so we got into scrapes. Yeah. But I mean, having said that, it makes it sound like my mum and I aren't close. We're really close, you know. Uh, you but dad and I, family. yeah, we're really close yeah. to family, my mum yeah. and my brother and I. But yeah. my dad and I were kind of like partners in crime when it came to this. So, mm -hmm. um, so when he died, I, I guess it wasn't just that I lost a very good friend. I lost someone who shared a way of looking at the world. And I found that really lonely as well. It just struck me how much I'd never thought about this before, but in, I mean, and I know your, your interest in, in wildness um, has to do, and which I'd love to talk with you about, sort of thinking about what, the way we use landscape and the power of memory, uh, but wildness sounds a lot like grief, like mm. the way we imagine what a wild state is, the state of grief is, like yeah. to become estranged. You know, you're identifying with all these different people with mm. this, or beings, the goshawk, 
T.H. White, mm. your father maybe, um, it, but you're also becoming estranged from yourself. Absolutely, and one of the reasons the book is called Ages for Hawk is because I think, I like to think it's a, that idea of a child's alphabet. It's about having to learn the world again after it becomes, or learn how to read the world again after it becomes completely uncomprehensible. And mm. when you, I mean, I, d I, don't, I mean, certainly I felt when my dad died, I, my, I didn't know who I was anymore. He, w he was part of, you know, his, you know, it happens to everyone when families start to disappear or you lose important people. You, you forget, you don't know who you are or where you are in the world. And, and you start to try and inhabit other selves or, or make a new person that can somehow incorporate that grief within yourself. I, quite often I'll hear people say, to, you know, that, you know, oh, grief is something that you get over. And then I just get furious, you know, the Irish side comes out. I'm like, no, that's a really <laughs> terrible thing to say. You never get over grief. You just become a new person that can hold it within yourself. That's the important thing. So you kind of try on new selves. And I think one of the things that animals, one of the roles that animals play in our life is that they let us kind of imagine ourselves as different things. So as I was talking to a psychoanalyst recently, not, not in a professional capacity, I hasten to add, in a, we were having coffee. And he said he has a woman who comes to his sessions with a dog. She has great problems in ex expressing her emotions. Um, and she sits there and they'll talk and eventually there'll be a silence and the woman will say, my dog's very angry with you now, <laughs> right? I mean, he knows what's happening. She knows what's happening. The dog obviously hasn't got a clue. Right. But, <laughs> but the dog lets her say things that she couldn't otherwise say. Yeah. And I think that's you know, one of the interesting things about animals. And I talk a lot in this, I mean, I mentioned in this book how there's this whole series of books by male gay authors in, in England in particular about these close relationships with animals. They can't talk about their real loves, their real desires, or their real need to be in domestic spaces with same-sex partners, but they can talk deeply about love for animals. Right. And I just find that really poignant. Um, I didn't answer the question at all, but I'm, I've got somewhere else. Yeah, no, no, no. This is really fascinating. I mean, it's sort of what you were writing about. We think through animals, you yeah. know? We think through nature. I'm curious what... I was thinking on the way over here that, you know, living in an urban environment like we do, and of course, you were you were wandering around with Mabel in Cambridge, which is not, you know... Some it's an eccentric place, but there are limits. Right. Do you know, there was, there was quite often little boys would run past and shout, Harry Potter, at me, which was really <laughs> annoying. <laughs> Because I'd be like, this is you not an owl, it's a coming, gospel, right? right? Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> but there is something, that, I mean, that sort of speaks to it. I was thinking, like, in the election recently, did you read about this, that, you know, there was this famous... Is that the bald eagle thing? With, with the, the bald eagle attacking was so great. Donald Trump? <laughs> but then the little bird that flew and perched on Bernie Oh, you Sanders. know what? That made me cry. But then I got really upset because that bird is thirsty, and what it's doing is pecking at the water bottle. Oh, and I'm God. like, Bernie, you should have taken the cap off the water and give it a little bit of water. Because that would have really done it, I think. If he would have, yeah, that would have, you know, the president yeah, if yeah. you fed that bird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I mean yeah. that that sense that we still think now, even today in our kind of, you know, even to listen to me, I sound like I'm a billion years old. Even today in our modern world, things like that seem to have a significance that isn't just a lost bird in an auditorium trying to get something to drink. Yeah. You know, that meant something to those people. And I think, you know, we, you know, it's important to think about animals as not just being things from science. You know, there are other stories about them which are still really important to think about. And I think one of the most important jobs we have now is what I try to do a bit of in this book, and that is to try and understand why we value nature and natural things and animals and landscapes the way we do, because we use them to prove our own ideas about the world back to ourself. You know, I always think there's that bit about, you know, sort of people sort of saying, you know, that, you know, birds of prey are like fighter jets. And it's like, well, they're mm. not really like fighter jets, but you're just saying basically fighter jets are natural like birds of prey. That's, you know, it's kind of that what we do all the time. Mm -hmm. And at the time we're living in now, which is basically the sixth great extinction, trying to understand why we value nature, I think, is the, it's the most important job we have. I really do. I'm on my soapbox now. You see, talking about Bernie that's done it. Yeah. <laughs> It's the season. For Where's the bird boxes? that's going to come down and right, have, have right. some water? It would be incredible. Um, the that that thing you just said that you know nature animals shouldn't just be objects of science that you know and they aren't they're part of literature and all of the arts and all of that made me think about your poems. You have this book Shaler's Fish, and I wondered if you would be so kind because you are a poet. And your writing in here is so poetic, if you would read one Thank of your you. poems. Can I give a little tiny little sort of short uh, intro? Yes. So this is so much fun. I wrote these poems um, a long time ago when I was a student, actually. And um, back when I was, you know, I used to wear black and... Wait a minute. 
<laughs> suddenly realised that wasn't the thing to say. I'm, I'm much more cheerful now. Um, I fell in with a whole bunch of poets in Cambridge who were working in, in a way that was very much against the prevailing tradition of poetry in England at the time. They were very experimental, they loved being very playful with language, and I loved these, writing these poems. It felt to me like I was compiling kind of things that were halfway between lyric poetry, cryptic crosswords, and abstract expressionist painting. I mean, I, I just loved them. Anyway, so I'm really pleased they're out again now. Um, and I'm going to just read one um, towards the end of the book. It's called Mir which stands for um, the, the Russian space station, which is now defunct. It shows you how long ago these poems were written. And also it's a military acronym for uh, mishap identification report, because everything in poetry has to have at least two meanings, including mm. titles, right? <laughs> and this is a poem about, um, it's about memory and tourism and uh, souvenirs. I guess that's kind of, hopefully it's, you know, but it's, it's, it's kind of a, you should let it wash over you. Uh, Mia. A fragment of paint, a carrying bolt Deira had missed, and the threat of rain so prolonged that the dictation of miracles was abandoned. These simplicities were useless to me, though war was all there was to see, scat and hesitancy, the brilliance of a star, the sapphire's boxed array, the cobra beside the stone, and all I saw was the naught on the scales as the snake moved, not the crowds, nor the pigeon egg diamond in the hilt of the vizier's armory, the lock of hair, or the hand of bronze to kiss. Only egrets, white through lignite and soft hydrocarbons, and each wing a scant line of cartilage broken into ribs of light and shade. Every time the line progressed like silk, iron deer, tin diamond, and blue sky over top carpi, dismembering the fortuity of travel, one stop and bracketing. This was the world as it existed for our amusement. Satisfaction snipped from empirical brochures entire. Ginza, Hadramaut, Nazca in six by four, milled, screened, and bleached to cuttle ink by months of sun and wind. There are 12, including the pyramids, the tower in Paris, the bowed milk of the opera house, and the silver heaped about Bilbao the thin crenellations of a wall about hills and the lights of a city west of an inland sea. No distinction is offered, for these are tokens only. Your farewell is only the cuttings looking at me. Their derivation is both more than ours and lessening the marketable and the promise of these cities both. Either could be plain, although bells are ringing, it is only the changes they're practicing fringes meshing into an airy October night, and overhead, a point of light traveling away from the setting sun, the falling station describing its sear arc before it passes behind, behind clouds and enters the shadow of the world. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Put my special ra BBC Radio 4 voice <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice. <laughs> so when you're teaching students at Cambridge, do you use poetry, literature to talk about natural history or...? Uh, yeah, sometimes. I, sorry, I, I haven't been teaching because this book has unexpectedly done quite well and I haven't really had time to do much teaching, so I'm, I do miss that. I mean, it's yeah. it, one of the great things about being at Cambridge is the ability to teach one-on-one -on -one supervision, which is really real luxury. Um, so, and I was teaching both English and history of science. So yes, yeah, certainly English. Uh, but history of science too, yeah, we, you know, you try and get um, mainly looking at the history of natural history through scientific writings. And what was really interesting in was trying to work out where the boundaries are in our culture between science and non-science. Mm -hmm. So what makes kind of amateur birding not science, but the same, a different person watching the same bird do the same things is science. And I think trying to find out where those boundaries are is really interesting. So yeah, we used to use literature to think about those subjects. Yeah. yeah. Um, you said leading into this that um, it's about memory and a kind of a souvenir and this book this book is so much about memory yeah. about the power of memory um, on a personal level but on a political level too or a communal level you know how do we remember the past how do we use landscape to remember yeah. it um, how we change it how we change the past in retrospect we do yeah. it all the time yeah. yeah both our own personal pasts and our national and political pasts. Yeah. yeah. It just struck me that like there's a way in which um, g going hawk or you know kind of entering into this feral state 
and that kind of expanded vision it gave you, if you were able to take that to your father and to his life and to kind of open up your remembering of him and thinking about him, did, mm -hmm. it, did it sort of shift in the way you saw him or kind of connected to him? Uh, my, well, my father was colorblind, uh, which was funny when, when newspapers stopped, stopped printing black and white pictures and going into color, he was like, oh no, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> Um, he wants to be a pilot and couldn't because, you know, that's how he ends up being a yeah. photographer. So, I mean, that's, that's a roundabout way of saying. Um, I think he already sort of saw the world the way the hawk did, actually. I think really? he had an extraordinary eye. I um, mean, obviously, not literally like a hawk did because hawks can see so many more things than we can. They can see ultraviolet light, they can see polarized light, you know. I mean, they, someone once said that a, a hawk's vision compared to human vision is like color TV compared to black and white TV. So, mm -hmm. But I think that ability to kind of see the world as a whole, as this exquisite pattern of light and shade and color was how my father saw. So maybe in a way I was trying to kind of see like him through the hawk, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I miss him, I still miss him, he was a, you know, he was a, he was a good man. Yeah, yeah, he sounds like an incredible man. Well, he okay. was a very, as I say, he was a very private man. People sometimes say, why isn't there more of him in the book? Why don't you talk more about his life? And I, a couple of times he'd said to me, you know, I want my photographs to stand for my legacy, so I thought I'd respect that. And similarly, my mum and my brother, you know, people sometimes say, you bastard, why didn't you spend more time with them, you know? And I'm like, well, I kind of saw them more than I say in the book. But again, they're both alive, and I wanted them to be able to tell their own stories. So yeah. Sorry yeah. about swearing in the church. <laughs> I feel quite bad about that now. Um, well, let's open it up for questions, because I know there must be many. Yeah, so. no, far yeah. away. Um, I, one of the, yes, it's, it's a person... Oh, we have, we have roving mics. We'll have microphones. This is great. It's like a TV game show. This bring is really them cool. around, yes. Yes. If you could raise your hands for us, great. Hello? Oh. That went really quickly, didn't it? Thanks. It took hours. <laughs> um, I loved your book, so I mean no offense by my question, but how is it moral to keep and tame a wild animal. Right. It's usually illegal because we feel it's bad for them. Why is falconry ethical? Well, I think it is ethical for lots of reasons. And I think one of the things that's interesting is I think it is one of the last legal ways that we're allowed to interact with wild animals. Um, and I think falconry is a particularly special way of doing it. It's incredibly ancient. I mean, we're talking one of the earliest relationships between people and animals. It doesn't involve the animal being eaten. Um, it's often considered by people who haven't done it to represent a relationship that's founded on domination and subjection of a wild creature. Um, anyone who has sat and watched a falcon interact with a hawk will start to kind of get a slow understanding that that's not really how it works. Obviously, the hawk is completely free uh, when it's flown, so if, if you upset the hawk or make it angry or offend it in any way, it will just fly away. And in fact, if you go back to early modern Europe, one of the reasons that aristocrats like to show off that they could fly hawks so well um, apart from showing off they had horses and big retinues, was that it was a visible, a visible display that they could govern wisely, because everyone knew that if you were mystery to hawk, it will fly away. Um, and Mabel, I mean, I like to think that if it's done well, and like everything, like child rearing, if you do, you know, no, not everyone is a brilliant falconer. Um, I can't believe I said that, that sounded awful. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'm sure I'd be a terrible mum, actually. But um, if it's done well, I think it's a very enlightened relationship. I mean, Mabel flew at least as much as a wild hawk free doing her stuff. I wanted her to do as much goshawk behavior as, as imaginable. And instead of going up a tree to digest her food and sleep in the evening, she used to just watch TV with me and, and, and do the same. <laughs> so I think, you know, of course one there are interesting kind of questions about how much we're allowed to relate to the natural world. And I, I do feel worried that increasingly it's considered to be behind a glass wall. We're not supposed to touch it. It's precious, we're not supposed to touch it. And I think that people don't really fight to protect things unless they know them, because if you don't know them, you can't love them. And I, I get scared about nature being seen as a picture. Mm -hmm. I like to think that we might be able to have more, more contact with it. So that's my... That's my, that's my take on it. But well, I understand, I understand people get upset. We'll take the next question over here. I don't have my glasses on, I can't, oh, hello. <laughs> hello, first of all, thank you, it was wonderful. Thank you. I was lucky to be brought here by my bird watching friend. But I'm a birder too. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, 
Do you know Al Oliver Sacks' writing on colorblindness? Because I think that might give you, if you don't know it, insight into what your father saw. Oh, really? It's some of the most fascinating writing about colorblindness I've ever seen. Oh, wow. Well, I haven't read that. I will, I will go straight back they, and, and... They're in two different, of his, two of different works, but I'm sure you can find them. Thank you. Line with the Thank rest you. of us. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, that's a, I love questions that tell me to read things. They're my favorite. I love that. <laughs> I wasn't being sarcastic. I meant that. That was really nice. Thank you. Well, I didn't know I'd be here. In. <laughs> um, no, that's a really interesting question. Um, initially, I had a few wobbles, actually. Um, the book, unexpectedly for me, won a couple of major awards in Britain, and the, the first one I was just astounded at. Um, the second one, after it won, I went back to my hotel room and I cried for about an hour. I was completely overwhelmed, because I think I realized that you know, life wasn't going to be quite as it had been. Um, and I've been touring with the book now for a year and a half. Things I've discovered are interesting. I've discovered I'm more of an extrovert than I thought I was. Um, and it's a weird thing. I mean, writing a book is a very lonely occupation. You don't see anyone. You sit at your desk, you cry, you know, because mm. some days it's awful. Um, you eat junk food, and in my case, you also chain smoke. Bad. Um, <laughs> and you don't know whether anyone's going to read it. And then suddenly, you know, I'm in a hall full of awesome, lovely people. It's a very weird split in, in, a, in a writer's life. But... Um, my mother is very happy. Um, <laughs> she, uh, she rang me up a while ago and said, um, Helen, there's some very nice garden furniture in the garden center down the road. And I thought, this is weird. So it's very expensive. And I thought, and she said, are you going to be all right now? And I said, what do you mean? She went, financially. And I said, oh my God, mom, go and buy the furniture. Oh, I'll buy it for you. <laughs> And I realized that my mother has always been worried about me. As an academic, as a historian, I was very penniless. And the fact that I can now pay my bills, you know, I'm not, I'm not you know, a millionaire or anything, but I can pay my bills, has made her very, very relaxed about, m about my life. And that's kind of actually one of the best things about this book is that. And also meeting people. And actually, it's just my life has changed completely. I was in Hollywood last week. I'm like, what, what even, you know? <laughs> I'm a creature of muddy hillsides, and here I am at Soho House talking to movie stars. So it's extraordinary. This, this is going to be made into yeah. a movie, right? Yeah, uh, right. Lena Headey from Game of Thrones. Yep. How the evil queen from Game of Thrones was going to play has me. Has bought the rights. <laughs> <laughs> you are so lucky. You're the luckiest I mean, woman in the world. I mean, she is so cool. I met, I met her, and I'm just like, you know, I could barely speak. I'm like, oh, my God, it's the evil queen. I mustn't drink any wine. I'm going to be poisoned, right? Um, <laughs> But she really gets the book, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted. I mean, of course, it's, you know, it's really interesting, and, and I was asked initially, would you like to you know, be involved in writing the, you know, the screenplay or you know, doing a treatment? And I just sort of said, no, I don't think I'd be very good at that. And um, you know, writing a book's a bit, this is gonna sound really terrible, metaphor, but writing a book's like making a pot or a cake or something. You, know, you make the thing as well as you can, and then you have to give it, a, you have to give it away. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so, but it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. so. We yeah, have our lots next of question. Have changed. Our next question. Hi. Hi. I just, <laughs> um, I just wanted to say I love the book and thank you. It meant a lot to me. I lost, I lost my dad about 10 years ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, I can hear my voice. No, shaking. no, no. I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> ever, it doesn't ever stop being hard. Um, so I wanted to ask about the impetus to write versus like the grieving process. I know it's very long. And you know, like in terms of like, when did that come? I mean, were you training Maple and some aware somewhere in the back of your mind, like this is needs to become art, not just my grieving process? Right. Like where do those intersect? And yeah. you know, was it seamless? Was it painful or was it cathartic as so many people think? And yeah. how natural was the writing process? That's a really, really good and complicated question. Uh, no, no, I mean really, really complicated in all the best ways. Complex, maybe, not complicated. Um, so it wasn't until the end of that year when I was a, a little bit less bonkers after I'd realized that I'd made this great mistake of trying to get lost in the wild when I, I needed human balance and human love in my life as well. My friends forgave me, bless them. My mom brother did too. Um, that I started to see that there was a shape to what had happened that was a story that was much bigger than me and older than me and, and it was like an old kind of almost like a myth 
of going into the underworld and coming back mm -hmm. with a hawk by my side. And, and um, I, I mean that kind of, you know, not to kind of say that, you know, I created it, but I think that a lot of these stories are bigger than us and work through us. You know, we don't, we don't tell the stories, they, they're told through us. And I thought maybe I'll write this down one day, I don't know, and, but it took five years. I needed five years distance to get to the point where I could treat myself as a character in the book, because if I, I don't think I could have done it before then. It was too raw, um, and I, yeah, I mean, it was still hard. The bits about the hawk were easy, but the bits talking about seeing my father in hospital when he was gone, I mean, that was really hard to write. So it was still hard, um, but, and I, I didn't think it was grief work, but then when I finished the book, I remember writing the last paragraph, and then I felt really unwell, like dizzy and, and a bit sick, and I realized that it had been. I mean, it really had been a, I'd finished something, and it, it was a way of saying goodbye, not just to my father, but to the person I'd been back then. And that was a really intense moment. But it takes a long time. It takes a long time to, you know. And, and one of the things that I've, I've been amazed at, and I'm sure everyone here who's lost people know, is that, you know, sometimes they really recede in your life, and you can't remember them very well, and then they come back. And as soon as I'd finished the book, my father was incredibly clear in my mind again. And it was like he'd sort of come to pat me on the back. It was a lovely feeling. Mm. And yeah, but it, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to write about bad times. I'm so sorry for your losses. Thank you. Uh, the person, there's lots we'll of We'll take the next question over here. Hi. Hello. I loved your book also, Thank and I uh, uh, wanted to make two points. I was so, I loved um, The Once and Future King as a child, and your remarks about how T.H. White went through all those names and, and the role of names in The Once and Future King, and then to end up with Goss, I just found so poignant. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted to ask you about the time when you go exploring with Mabel near the end, and you come upon this, like, kind of, you reach this place where it's like this kind of, like, magical landscape that's kind of purple, and yeah. um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there's a bit at the end of the book when I'm, uh, I'm sort of recovered a bit. There was, in fact, the recovery was really interesting. There's a bit in the book I don't talk about. There's a, every morning I'd get up in the mo and I'd check the sky when I was flying the hawk, just to sort of see whether, what the weather would be like to fly her. So, you know, wind condition, you know, cold front coming over, precipitation, I was like a little aviator. And then one day I looked up at the sky and thought, that looks really beautiful. And I knew at that point that things were gonna be okay, that I was gonna come back from where I'd been. And but my understanding of the world had changed at that point, and I had understood how short our lives are and how the world is full of magic that you can see if you look at it the right way. And I go for this walk with my mum's village. Um, again, it may have been poaching a bit. And I meet this couple who talk about how beautiful it is to see the deer in the, in the valley. And I'm really pleased that they saw the deer. And then they say, isn't it great that there's still a bit of old England left with all these immigrants coming in? And my heart breaks. You know, and there's a bit in the book where I talk about how everything, you know, I just, I've worked out, you know, you, everything that I see in the, English in the English landscape all comes from other places. You know, deer, hares, squirrels, pheasants, they're all imports from various, you know, places, and they all belong to the land, and it belongs to them. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a special bit where I talk about seeing a hare and some deer, and they're in this huge chalk valley, and as I watch, they run in different directions, and it's like some kind of veil is lifted in the landscape parts. And I think at that point I'd open myself out to there being magic in landscapes that wasn't just about getting lost. It was about feeling at home again. And how you can feel at home wherever you come from. And you can make places your own. So that was a kind of bit of, bit of political kind of stuff there. So yeah. In the book. Um, yeah. Thank you. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying this. I don't really want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> I'd like to tell you how much my I, how much I have enjoyed your book, but also my groups. I'm a book group facilitator. Hello, and we've book had group. some wonderful, <laughs> wonderful discussions of your book, and some very painful for people who've gone through some emotional experiences as well. But I'd like to ask you a little bit about the science, the professionalism of science versus the naturalist tradition, the English footpaths, the fact that you know people sort of naturalized um, for centuries, really, and what's happened to that tradition and the professionalism that's now 
sort of attacked what's, science. What's, what's happened to the natural tr history tradition in Britain? Kind of, yes. Yeah. Um, the fact that there was an amateur, yeah. uh, and many amateurs discovered some rather amazing mm. things. Mm. Um, and um, I have a son who's a neuroscience researcher and works with primates, and there's a lot of research now being done with birds. Mm. Um, and uh, I was just sort of curious about, you know, what you think of this what's happened to this tradition. And yeah, I mean, the, neuro, the neuroscience tradition is fascinating. I mean, the, my, my friends in the experimental, well, my friends, people I know in the experimental psychology department at Cambridge University are doing stuff with crows and jays and corvids and learning, and they kind of, you know, do brain scans. I mean, it's amazing stuff. Um, the tradition of amateur natural history observation, I guess, in the 1930s sort of ended up sort of becoming ethology, or 1950s, really, not 30s, but it became a kind of special offshoot of amateur natural history that involved scientists who are professional scientists watching animal behavior in the field. Um, and um, it's really interesting that, yeah, I mean, the stories you're allowed to tell about animals do seem to be thinning. Um, you're supposed to talk about them in particular ways now, in ways, you know, anecdotal kind of natural historical ways tend not to be privileged. But one thing that has happened in the last sort of um, 50, 60, 70 years has been this wonderful up, up, um, growth in citizen science. And I think this is absolutely marvelous. And it's very big here, right? You have the bird counts, you have people, and particularly with the internet now, you have this extraordinary ability for people to contact and communicate with each other online about natural history. So for example, I'm on Twitter, which you know I love. I kind of live and breathe Twitter. And I've become really, really excited about this. People often sort of say, people don't like that nature anymore. They just walk around with their heads in phones. And yet, I see constantly on Twitter people photographing lichens, mosses, strange plants, strange rocks, fossils, and putting them on the internet and saying, what is this? Mm -hmm. And people coming in and saying, that's this, you want to read this book? So I mean, I see that, you know, I think it's actually going to hopefully become a new golden age of amateur natural history from that kind of uh, viewpoint. I really hope so, because we need to get out there, right? Uh, and, and, and see it all. That's a really good question. I'll think more about that. Our next question is up here. Hi. Hello. I managed to finish your book up just this past weekend when I was visiting my daughter at college. And it concludes, of course, with you taking leave from Mabel and looking at all the physical aspects of her that are not going to be the same yeah. the next time that you see her. Yeah. So it was very poignant for me. And I want to know how long the separation was. And did she recognize you when That's she such saw a good you question. again? So if you haven't read the book, this is not really a spoiler. But at the end of the book, there's this recognition, recognition that everything changes. And that's fine. So um, I put her in a giant aviary, you know, sort of about the size of, of this, to molt out all her feathers and grow new ones for the next year. And just, we just you feed her lots of really rich food. And I have a rest, right? Because flying a goshawk is quite exhausting. <laughs> and um, as I put her in there, I realized that, you know, she wouldn't see me for about four months. And all the books have told me that goshawks, if you leave them for two days, they become completely wild. And I knew that when I saw her again, she wouldn't be brown and cream and with these yellow eyes. She'd be like a sort of incredible icy kind of gray and white with these stare. And I thought, you know, that's all right. You know, that's okay. And then I went back to collect her in the autumn. And she was like, oh, hi, Helen. <laughs> completely remembered me. She's as tame as anything. I mean, she was scared of other people, but she was as tame as me as she ever had been straight away with me. So that, yeah, the books were wrong. Um, no, I think, I, I do think that, that a lot of the guys that were writing books about goshawks had some serious investment in goshawks being these remorselessly wild animals that would forget you and, you know. I, th I mean, a lot of the work about goshawks in particularly Victorian books tend to be written, as I say in the book, it's all about women. Right, goshawks are hysterical, you can't control them, they have moods, they go and ignore you, um, they forget you if you ignore them, they be, you know, become hysterical. <laughs> These, and they all seem to be really obvious mappings of, of kind of anxieties about gender, and I think this might be one of them. Yeah, yeah, bless her. Thank you. There's one down here, or? No? These are great questions. Hello. So my question is, um, once Mabel passed, have you flown since? Have you flown hawks? I've flown a lot of airplanes this month. Um, no, uh, have I flown a hawk since? Yeah, Mabel died, uh, I'm sorry, you know, uh, uh, many years after the events in this book. She died of a horrible fungal infection called yeah, aspergillosis. So. It was very out of the blue, and, and it's a real bane of goshawkers, wild goshawks as well. Um, I have a parrot now. Um, <laughs> 
I'm always embarrassed about this. My friends tell me it's emotionally more healthy than a hawk. I'm not so sure. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I love it. It's very cuddly. But um, if you upset a goshawk or offend it by mistake, it will be upset and then it will forgive you. Very simple emotional creatures. Parrots really aren't. Um, if you upset my parrot by mistake, it will remember and it will come and get you. I've got more scars from my parrot than I ever had from the goss. Um, I really would like to fly another hawk. I don't have time now. I have a very good friend who's a very good parrot sitter, and they're really good friends. But uh, I, you know, I need, if I want another hawk, I, I want to fly it every single day for hours, and I just haven't got the time. So when things calm down, yeah, there'll be another hawk. I mean, I'm, it's who I am, right? But there'll be n never, be a, never be one like Mabel. She was like, you know, people say there's, there's the dog, right? She was the hawk. What's your strongest memory of her? I mean, what's the thing her you think playing. about? Her yeah. playing. Yeah, her playing. I remember once um, she found a Kit Kat chocolate wrapper on the floor, and she jumped down, and it scrunched. And she was like, and then all her feathers went up. And she was just like. <laughs> 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 and I'm just like, what are you doing, Mabel? She's like, I got it. <laughs> it was, she was, yeah, her playing. I mean, she is so kind of, you know, down to earth, a bird. Hawk, um, but you also write. I think right at the beginning, you say, you know, like goshawks, like spotting one is like a like a form of grace. Yeah, wild know? ones are very hard to see. Yeah, they come yeah. and go, and yeah. you can't, you have no control over it. And I did wonder if, in any way, your relationship with Mabel and thinking about these histories of birds and falcons and hawks in mm. any way produced in you a form of spirituality or that relationship. It's a really interesting question. Yeah, I was surprised about this. A lot of the when I was trying to find words for lots of the emotional experiences that happened in this book, I couldn't find any secular ones quite often. I needed to use religious terms or theological terms because there weren't any other terms that fitted, mm -hmm. like grace, you know, uh, epiphanies. Um, they were the only ones that captured what was happening. I mean, I guess in the sort of, I mean, I grew up in this terribly godless family, you know, two journalists, it's not kind of, you know. Um, but yes, I mean, I certainly have the hawk ushered in both a sense that the world was full of numinous things that are much more than just the everyday, you know, objects, um, but also that strong awareness that we are all here again for a very short time and the boundaries between life and death are very small and that's the great mystery. Um, so yeah, yeah, she taught me some, some things like that too, yeah. Well, your book has taught all of us a lot, and thank you thank so much. Thank you. For thank you very much. I've had a lovely time. Thank you.